Okay, so I think everybody is uh, starting to come in. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we're live. Uh, so hello, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Danielle stein Uh I am a financial modelling specialist and I am your virtual meetup host. So welcome, everybody. Uh, it is uh, midday. It's 12.30 here in Sydney, and uh, we've got Sylvia's joining us from uh, from LA. So I believe it's uh, about 5.30 for you, is that right? Yes, it is. It's happy hour here. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. So, yeah, um, I'm, uh, yeah, my job uh, whenever we run these sessions is to bring you various and fabulous speakers from around the world to talk to you about topics of interest to the financial modelling and Excel community. And today will be no exception. But before we begin the session, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I am today, which is Sydney. It is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here today. So uh, my special guest today is uh, Sylvia Yuhas. So hey Sylvia, um, you Hi. look like you are in the Starship Lounge today, is that right? Yeah, we're in, we're in the lounge. Uh, we may take it over to the engineering room for the demos, but you know, it's, it's happy hour here. So I realize it's lunchtime in Australia, but uh, but yeah. I, I figured you guys wouldn't mind. So, yeah, you know. yeah, love it. Loving your virtual background, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm ready, so, room. ready for I'm so, room. yeah, I'm so happy to um, to have you back. So welcome back to Public Life. Thank um, you. We haven't seen much of you lately. And just I know, bit... I have, it's true, I have been in hiding, but um, I'm really delighted to be back. Um, yeah. And hello to anyone in the Excel community who I've met before. I don't know exactly who's on, but that makes it kind of fun mm. and exciting. And yeah, we've got um, yeah tons of tons of people on. It's, uh, yes, and well, it's, I hope we have some. Uh, I know we have at least a few Excel uh, modeler designer types like yes. us who yes, uh, definitely who definitely. are frequently charged with the task of creating mm. Excel models for non Excel people. So that's kind Which of what we're here to talk about. Is today. what we're talking about. So just to give you a bit of background, I first met Sylvia in um, at a conference. A live yeah. conference and a first person in conference. San Jose, in sunny San Jose. It was a yeah, lifetime yeah. ago. Yeah. And then I think we were probably just about the only women there, yeah, which is why I went up to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then yeah. after that, when I got back home, um, I was a guest on XL TV, uh, yes. which um, I just loved. And you guys were so ahead of your time when you were doing. Uh, right. doing XL TV it was uh, it was just fantastic and um, it was good fun. yeah so um, Sylvia is an Excel consultant uh, mm -hmm. she's an author she wrote a book together with Bill Jellin who's uh, Mr Excel uh, and uh, yeah as I said she's based in Los Angeles and uh, yeah she told me she does have an agent is that right you have an it, agent it for your true we all we all have them in LA even you know the the uh, coffee shop baristas but they they have agents for different reasons than me, so yeah, yeah, just for your for your Excel consulting work. <laughs> well, so right? far, yeah, I mean, they you know outside of Excel, after after my Excel TV career, it kind of all went uh, sliding downhill for good. So, so I don't know. I think I've ruined my chances for acting for life. But uh, but hey, we all kind of have to play a role in <laughs> Excel designers, right? So. So yeah, cool. which is uh, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah. So, um, oh, I'm just seeing the chat. Oh, wow, we've got people from all over. We've got, um, oh South yeah, Africa, we're uh, yeah, Perth, Pittsburgh, uh, Minneapolis, all over the place. So, um, take it sure. away, Sylvia. I'll, oh, all right. hello, there's your co-presenter. Yes, this has is made my co-presenter. She's going to uh, she's going to share the screen. Beams, would you mind sharing my screen? All right, good timing. So, uh, let's. Um, Let's have a chat about, uh, hopefully you can all see um, yes, the uh, presentation see. here. So the title of the theme of our presentation today is Bend It, Don't Break It. And what we mean by that is don't break my Excel model. It's something we've all heard ourselves say at one point or another. So um, truly this is, this is targeted for uh, people who build models, but but if for those of you who are just uh, Excel enthusiasts and fans, um, you will hopefully also pick up a few new tricks and tips. So it's gonna be a little bit of a combo 
platter of um, discussion and demonstration. So I want to encourage everyone to please chime in on the various chat forums if you have a question or would like to uh, make a comment and we'll endeavor to respond to you in real time as much as possible. So um, as, as Danielle mentioned, I've been you know, dipping in and out of the Excel community for some time. So I know a lot of you out there already, please do connect with me on LinkedIn if you have not. Um, so uh, where have I been? Well, in my Excel life, it's one of those things, you know, the, the time that I kind of stepped away, I got involved in project management and, but quite honestly, at the end of the day, they always pull me back in. And that's my last Robert De Niro impression of the evening, I promise. But it is, it is a bit like that. You know, you kind of think you're away from it for a while and you just get sucked right back in. But, so today, as we mentioned, um, we're gonna talk about building models for non-Excel end users. And um, one of the recurring themes is this problem we have with something called simplicity because that's often what our clients want, right? They always say they want something simple and that means a whole lot of things. So we'll get into some of that. Um, and then we'll talk about some specific tips, especially when you're designing for non-Excel types. Um, and then we'll segue into a tech techniques showcase, just a few of um, many um, techniques that I like to employ in a lot of my work. And, and these are just you know a few of many, like I said, but they're, um, some of them are fan favorites, hopefully sure to blow your client's mind when you deliver all right, so we talked about this idea of simplicity, right? How many times have you heard your client say, let's just keep it simple, right? It's one of my, fav one of my favorites. So quick poll, uh, if you want, we're just gonna do an informal poll here. If you like to chime in on the threads, on the chats, um, please do. So your reaction, drum roll please, when your client says, let's keep it simple, do you A, burst into laughter? Do you B, just sit back and allow your cat to do the silent judging of what you know is the complexity of simplicity? Or C, do you plunge into your So just, uh, just pop it in the chat, um, what, whether, you're, whether you are A, B, or C. Okay, we're getting, haha, we're getting quite a few A's. Yes, I think that's what most people, <laughs> oh, a couple of B's, couple of B's. A uh, couple of B's. Yeah, yeah, mostly A's and B's. Oh, uh, that's what yeah, I figured, yeah. A's and B's. C's <laughs> are like when you're starting out in your career. That was, that was definitely me every time, right, because... A, B, C. You really want to deliver. You want to do it all, and then you realize how complex this mm -hmm. objective of simplicity is, right? So, for those of you who who don't fit into any one of these categories, I would like to find out if it's because you're just some kind of unicorn. Because honestly, that objective of keeping it simple is 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 just quite impossible, uh, honestly, when it comes to the type of things that we build as Excel designers. So even Einstein, according to the internet, so it must be true, uh, once said as must simple be. as possible. It is true, I know it is, but you know how people Google quotes and then they automatically assume everything on the internet is true? <laughs> Causes a lot of problems in the world, but I digress. So as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? So what, what we're really talking about here is Anytime the client says, keep it simple, what is really going on in the background there is they're looking for this. They're looking for that trifecta, right? And we all know that the reality is that is where the unicorn lives. So you, you can never really have a model that's good in good working order. In other words, it's, it's, it's accurate, it's, it's flawless, it, 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 you've got functionality, you can't have all of that stuff and also have it be fast and cheap. It just doesn't exist. And if you are one of those unicorns, please uh, contact me ASAP because I, I would like you to work for me. So how do we get to good enough, right? How do we get, uh, if that's our goal, if we wanna find that, that balance, um, what are we going to do to, um, to achieve this balance. So, so when it comes to technology, right, there's, there's this struggle between, you know, it's the man and machine, it's the us versus artificial, artificial intelligence. So how can we coexist? Well, 
I think my boyfriend, Dr. Spock, has some thoughts on that. And if um, this was from season two, episode 24, for my fellow uh, Trekkies, come at me, Star Wars people. Sorry. Um, the computer does not judge. It makes logical selections. And so this kind of stuck with me when I <laughs> watched The Ultimate Computer, because if we were to extend Dr. Spock's wisdom into the context of Excel development and the trade-offs there. What we're really talking about when, we, we, when we're relying on humans versus relying on computer logic is when you rely heavily on humans, you are relying on your end users and that means you're going to have to train them more. There's going to be more training involved on how to do things manually, how to, you know, what to do if a formula breaks down, all those types of things that we need to convey to our end users. Um, Relying on automation or computer logic, as Dr. Spock would say, means that there's more features, more code, more formulas for you to, to make bulletproof kind of on the back end. So all of this is to say that, yes, in fact, Excel development is both art and science. Um, and I, in fact, have a, a course. It's a few years old now, but hopefully 2022 will be the year that we update it. Um, called the art science of Excel modeling. Um, and just a little fun fact, side note, that is not to say you can't create actual art with Excel. Uh, my friends who call themselves the Frankens team, they're based out in, uh, actually in Budapest, my people, and um, they create these gorgeous works of art with Excel. These are, these are actually visualizations of pi using scatter plot charts. So um, cheers to the Frankens team for those uh, beautiful works of art. But anyway, I digress as usual. <laughs> any questions so far? No, no. Uh, and I meant to say, if you have any questions for Sylvia, anything you'd like her to address, uh, you can pop it in the chat. But if it's a particular question, you can uh, use the Q&A function and we will get to that as we go through. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, I do have a course called the Art Science of Excel Modeling. And um, these are the nine, it's actually a nine hour course, um, but I've, I've pulled a lot of the ideas that are still very relevant today, even though the course was um, from 2019, I believe. Um, but we're gonna talk about some of the concepts from that course, where I get into planning and building your bulletproof models. And I say bulletproof because it's not, you're never gonna achieve 100% perfection, but we can get a little bit closer, right? So here's some general broad tips for building lasting Excel models, especially for the non-Excel end user types. All right, so number one, um, which I, I think is an important one because we all struggle with it, especially as Excel nerds, Consider the modern versus classic Excel trade-offs carefully. So what do I mean by that? So um, Microsoft loves to, especially in the MVP community, congratulations, Diane, um, we are Danielle, sorry. Um, in the Excel community, they love to, you know, um, show off the latest, you know, X lookup, what did it come out in, in 2017 or something? And then everybody runs out and immediately wants to change all the V lookups that are in any model they ever created to X lookup because you don't have to put the column reference and da, da, da. So, which is fine but if you don't have 365 but if you don't have 365 so there's a lot of these trade-offs but I you know our natural instincts it, it, as developers is we want to try out all the new fancy stuff and a lot of times most of the time in fact clients are not early adopters guess what? Your client doesn't really care that you use Power Query. I'm so sorry to tell you, you know, and so... What? You tell me this now? I thought they all, right. all they care about is the, is the tool. That all they care about is which formula did you use? Which technique? No, they don't care, do they? Those are all exactly, the, that's exactly the point is that they don't care. And we care because we live and breathe this stuff. And sure, over time, if you have those unicorn early adopter types, build it into your model but if and if or if it's there's some critical business reason why it should take advantage of of a lot of the great stuff that microsoft is doing you know more recently then absolutely do it but just recognize that there's going to be some coaxing and coaching and because people get very comfortable in their in their little world they know how to do a vlookup they want to you know put their feet up on the desk and think they're done forever so there it, it it goes beyond just oh there's a new formula out there so i have to use it right um, and I get into this, and we're, we're not going to actually do this demo, but I do get into this in an article that I wrote recently for Beeble.com, 
on automating emails from Excel. So we created, and, and I will, by the way, these files will, including the presentation, will be made available to you um, after today, I believe. Fantastic, thank, thank you. you. Yes. So um, back to the original point here. So with, with this um, project that I, I wrote the tutorial for this, I did have to think about, you know, what is the, and there isn't really a best way to do it, but, but this particular solution that involves creating this little um, table where we calculate employee bonuses and we put in people's emails and we, we use a simple Excel formula to, to come up with an email body and calc, you know, congratulations, your bonus is X. This is the basic functionality of the table. And then I realized there's a couple ways we could send out these emails. You can either use VBA, you can use Power Apps, which I know the MVP community and Microsoft are very excited about Power Apps these days. And I thought there are definitely pros and cons to each. Danielle mentioned 365. And so this gets back to where it really depends on your audience, right? Um, so if you're interested in the article, the link will be provided. I'm not going to read the, the slide, but, but it just kind of gives you an idea of the thought process. You really have to consider who is going to be using this thing. If they, if they are still on Excel 2010, you know, it happens. Maybe you're better off using VBA. Um, so armed with this knowledge, just a few uh, takeaways that I want to emphasize. It's natural for developer types to always want to implement the latest and greatest, but context is everything. In other words, you are designing for someone or an audience who is not a member of your Excel guru community, right? So resist the urge to design something that you are going to use uh, for yourself. So because most people you design for um, are not early adopters, all right? And they don't spend their weekends binging Excel YouTube. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mike Irvin. I love your channel, but... I've never met any client who's like, yeah, it's Saturday, I'm gonna, you know, kick it with some Excel is fun on YouTube. Although you should. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Segmenting your audience, tip number two um, for building bulletproof models. Notice we haven't demoed one Excel technique, and this should give you a clue as to the importance of planning when we build for others. All right, so segmenting your audience. What on earth do I mean by that? Well. We need to think about who our end users are, right? And one little trick you can use if you have, I, I kid, this is not an actual way to do it, but like if you're, if you're working with someone who gets Excel memes, like something like this, they're probably gonna know more than how to do a sum function, right? But uh, we need a more professional approach to thinking about, hmm, I wonder where my, how skilled my audience is or you know, what I should do about um, deciding who is allowed to touch my model. Well, it gets complicated, right? The devil's always in the details. And so in my, going back to the, the course that I mentioned, the art science of Excel modeling, I talk about audience segmentation. So you have to consider the client who signs your invoices, right? They're not typically the ones that are gonna be hands-on on your model, but they are signing your invoices. So they need to know that it's, it works and they need to know the costs involved. And so that's where the art of communication comes in, right? They might not wanna to touch your model, but they wanna see that their, their staff is able to use it and it's producing results. And then as far as the end users go, I like to divide them up if I can into, um, and by the way, these might overlap. They can and often do overlap, which makes things more complicated. But I like to divide my end users into what I call super users or admins and regular end users. Um, super users tend to have a little bit of a higher skill level, or at least you have provided them with more in-depth training. So, so the routine changes, things that you would expect um, the, the end user to be able to handle on their own, the, the super user should be heavily trained in how to do that. So there might be, for example, a back-end table. Oh, I need to add a new department to this list of departments so my drop-downs will work. Well, you want to make sure you have a trained super user who has heard of data validation um, and knows how to unhide a sheet or, or, or whatever the case may be, however you've got that model structured. Um, so end users will also need a, another kind of uh, focus in their training. 
if they're going to be the operators of your model. So maybe they have a very low Excel skill level and you need to design something that is truly just click a button and let us know if anything goes wrong, you know, so, um, so they, they can vary widely in their skill sets. And like I said, they can and do always overlap, but notice you as the developer, you really have to kind of, um, be able to bring all those worlds together. So do you really want this job is my question. <laughs> so those are the, those are kind of the takeaways here. Um, spend time getting to know your audience and focus on do not skimp over you know the the planning phase of your model building um, and the groups can and do overlap so you should plan accordingly um, and the the more you know training that is required or the more development that's required just make sure you you are honest with yourself about that at the beginning of a project um, because nothing can destroy a client relationship more than than having expectations be out of line <clears throat> All right, so speaking of training, there are, of course, different types of training when you're developing a model, what you should plan for. Um, broadly speaking, there's generic Excel training um, or model-specific training, and those can, have, those can be two very different things, right? So let's talk about some of my favorite ways to do generic Excel training. I, of course, have training uh, courses. Um, I do a lot of custom in-house Excel training for my clients. Um, but typically, anyone who touches your model should have some basic Excel proficiency. Again, I don't know. I, I often find that when I'm building a model and then giving it to the client, they end up learning a lot just from the process. I don't know if that, that's true. Yeah, I it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they kind of be want them to be invested in in the model, which is kind of the second point where you talk about the specific model itself, but um you, you want them to sort of have a certain amount of ownership and so they need to right you know, have, have right and this and this often the, the the general the generic excel training right it, it often comes after they've they've sort of poked around the model a bit they get inspired they yeah. go oh my god I, I would love to learn how to do this I, I never knew you could do that so it's also a good little you know segue to more to yeah i had someone the other day he said to me oh my gosh i learned so much just from going through your model. Like they just yeah. actually learned Excel from some of the the techniques right. and formulas I'd right. used. Right. Yeah. And that's a very, and that's, you know, one of the more rewarding, I just, mm -hmm. I've spent the last couple of slides complaining about <laughs> being a developer, but that is, that is definitely one of the more rewarding aspects of this, this career. So, you know, you want people to have some proficiency. Um, so again, try to, try to, get a sense of that at the beginning of the project um, and, you know, periodically do an assessment of what skills are going to be important for this, for anyone to have who might be a user of my model. Um, and one of the other ways that I've done that in the past is, you know, I, I rarely do, I don't know, Danielle, if you um, would concur, but I rarely do uh, like formal testing. I generally, um, like I don't make them take Excel tests or anything like that, but <laughs> right. I just kind of um, I learn a lot more about w who my audience is by conducting se shadow sessions. So, you know, when we're if we're redesigning a process uh, by way of some kind of new Excel model, then I might say, you know, let's spend an afternoon. And why don't you walk me through how do you down? How, what do you do when you create this report? Where do you get your data from? Is it Absolutely. Or yeah. Yeah. Because you can't, if, if you say, oh, how are your Excel skills? They might say, oh, yeah, they're really advanced, but they're not all well, it's, it's it's relative. Yeah. And yeah. I've always found those labels to be pretty meaningless. And it's another challenge of Excel training is then, you know, somebody who you don't know anything about them and they say, oh, we just want an, we, we want an intermediate or we want advanced because our people already know the basics. And then you find out, no, that's not true. You know, so so I think one of the best ways to do this in a targeted, efficient fashion is to, like I said, conduct shadow sessions. Show me what you do. Oh, you get this from a CSV file. Where does that CSV file come from? Do you click a download button and then what happens? So just really and then really pay attention to, especially when they get to the Excel part, you know, how are they manipulating the data? So that'll give you a really good sense of where they they are skill wise. Um, so, and, and then of course, on the subject of still here of generic Excel training, if you have your own programs or partnerships, great, you'll probably have an opportunity to pitch those, especially if you develop a great model. 
um, that inspires your client, but also um, <clears throat> leverage those built-in tutorials that nobody pays attention to. Sorry, Microsoft, it's true. Um, but I, in fact, just the other day, um, I was charged with the task of onboarding a new analyst at this client that I'm working with. And um, this person was meant to take over a bunch of spreadsheets that involved Power Query. And she had never used Power Query. And I said, well, why don't, you know, for starters, why don't you check out some of these tutorials that's built in, that are built into Excel? So you can direct your clients to, um, you know, when they go to create a new file, there's all these, you know, really like basic ones like take a tour or get started with formulas. And then I noticed recently they have a new Power Query one. So, so yeah, there's fantastic them. tools in there. Absolutely. There's some real, you know, I've done a few of them. I'm like, oh, these are pretty good. Um, but what I, what's really great about them is, is, especially if you don't have the kind of training ready to go out of your pocket to to you know deliver to this client and honestly i have worked with so many companies nobody has ever seen these because i would say well do why don't you do one of the built-in tutorials what are you talking about so then you have to go go to file click new ta -da, and there they are and not just the tutorials but they have all these lovely templates you know like um somebody so next time someone asks you can you build me a loan calculator? You can say, hey, file new, download the loan calculator. And then if you need to, you know, I can help you customize it after. But it's it's really, it's really, you know, why not leverage what's out there, right? So anyway, that's um, another tip for, so that's, that's pretty much it for generic Excel training. If anybody in the audience has some questions or, or, or comments on how they handle that situation, mm -hmm. I would love to hear them. Um, when it comes to model specific training, um, here's a little pop quiz. Um, <laughs> Cause we're going to talk a little bit about documentation next. So if I were to plot, um, on one axis, um, documentation quality and training effort, the effort that I have to put into training, which one would you say goes on the X axis and which one goes on the Y axis for comparing our effort that we have to put into training versus documentation, because that's one of the classic trade-offs. Mm. If you think about it. Interesting. So yeah, just pop it in the chat what you think. Oh, you're done. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> Henry says that. I'm gonna blame my cat for that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Henry <laughs> says X should be documentation and Y should be training. Yes, yes. Henry, you would be correct. So yes, what this is, you, you know, what this is um yeah, with this graph, and by the way, I didn't do this scientifically, I just estimated. But mm -hmm. yes, it is true that the more effort you put into documentation, um, you know, the, the so it's a it's directly proportional relationship is what I'm going to say. So if you don't put any effort into documentation, expect to do a lot of training. So that's um, something I have found to be definitely a recurring theme. And it's another consideration to, you know, it's an important one because when you are estimating how long something is going to take, because obviously that's one of the first questions, because um, that's yeah. time. Uh, Henry's asking why is the x-axis longer, but I think that's just a, it's just a, just for illustrative purposes. Well, <laughs> Henry, if you'd like to um, be a technical editor on my next one, I'd love to have you. No, oh, you're yes. absolutely right. It is a little, <laughs> we too, love little technical bit editors. longer, but thank you for pointing that out. All right, um, moving right along. Um, so developing your training plan, just some key takeaways there. Not all clients are created equal. If you're lucky enough to have a you know, department that has a bunch of advanced Excel users, um, you're, you're gonna you know, be able to make progress a lot more quickly. Um, but just don't assume anything. And, and you know, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, we don't want to assume that if our client tells us they are advanced that you know we're good to go you really want to dig in and find out what they mean by that so that's going to be critical for developing an efficient uh, training plan okay all right so speaking of documentation let's get a little more specific on that because like everything we've been talking about tonight it is not a one-size-fits-all task okay so that's tip number three um so for this 
one. Let's explore some and pop, popular. And by popular, this is my experience. This could be completely anecdotal, but I've only been doing this for 20 years, so what do I know? Uh, but some popular and some lesser used creative documentation styles. So time for style check. Sachet chante away. All right. Um, <laughs> Little poll, another little informal poll here. Which of the following approaches best describes your most typical documentation style for your custom Excel designs? So, um, do you use single worksheet style instructions that you embed directly in your model? Maybe you use a separate uh, document like a PowerPoint or a PDF that you create separately. Um, maybe you use little cell notes, you know, you little, little red triangles. I had a client once ask me, when, I think there's errors in the, all over this, the spreadsheet you created. Said, <laughs> why do, why do you think that? I said, I said, well, there's these little red triangles everywhere. You know, so there to help you. <laughs> okay. Don't assume anything, but you know, it, it was great. It was billable, billable time for me. Cause I just, I got to go. Let me show you. Just hover over that little red triangle. And she went, oh. So don't assume they know cell notes, but. Did you notice in the latest version, you can um, make the, they've changed the, the terminology of it, of course. Yes. Um, but you can also make them threaded now, which is. Which yes, is cool. I do. I, I did notice that. I always get confused as to which is which. But yeah, I, I do like the threaded ones if you're working on shared um, stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe... most people are saying A uh, or A and C, and Antoine says he also uses um, screen capture video uh, walkthrough, which is um, which is quite, uh, quite oh, that's handy. great. Yeah, and I should have Loom actually... or something like that. Uh, and idea. yeah, okay. yeah, and uh, Am Amathea says uh, nobody seems to. She uses A because nobody would open B. <laughs> that is a good point. And then, so would anybody watch the video? Because actually, I should have listed video. True, true. Yeah. yeah would they watch the video? video maybe. Yeah. yeah. So there's, you know, there's trade offs here too. And then um, I'm glad that people actually do it. Um, and, and hopefully, nobody is, is E because that's almost always a recipe for disaster. There needs to be some kind of documentation. So there's pros and cons with each. So let's get into some of those. I won't read them verbatim, but um, just basically instruction style. No offense to those who create instruction sheets, but they are the, the reason I, I find them a little, a little bit dated is because people don't read, not because there's anything wrong with them, but people don't have an attention span that goes beyond what's the what's the character limit now on Twitter, 240 characters. I mean, truly, people do not like to read. so. I find that to be a problem with instruction sheets. Also, they can be deleted. Also, they um, you know they don't necessarily get updated very easily when you change when you make changes to the rest of your model. It's easy to forget to go back and, and update that instruction sheet. And also, if your client makes changes to the model, who's going to update the instructions? So they 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 tend to get the outdated very quickly and easily unless you have some very tightly controlled process. Um, so that said, the caveat is a couple caveats there. If you do use them, at least at least use screenshots because you know because people don't read, we can kind of coax them a bit more if we use some visual um, stuff to go to go with it. And I have used instruction sheets, but I, I tend to reserve those for situations when it's more business process focused um, rather than directly related. <clears throat> to the model is, itself, and, and I'll give you an example there. Um, I, I had a client last year, um, scientists working with who who worked in research labs, and tightly in you know connected to the model was some processes uh, that that took place in the lab. You know they had these little machines that they were were studying biological samples, and those machines produced some kind of output that 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 fed the model, but. Um, the point I'm making there is the instruction sheet was a little more focused on, hey, when you're in the lab and you're using machine X, Y, Z, make sure you run this analysis before you use this. So it's a little bit, it's for processes that are, they're more on the business process side versus the Excel model itself. Um, so that would be my exception. If you guys have other reasons, feel free to talk me down, but let's move on to the next type. Um, we, we talked about this already, 
and somebody brought up the videos and the, the separate documents. So some of the challenges there, um, is when it's separate from the model, it, 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 it's lost, right? So you really have to have a tightly controlled audit process um, to make sure that people who are using your model know that there is some sort of external instruction uh, to look at whether that's a PDF or a video or whatever. So you might be going at this point, well, what the heck does Sylvia do? She doesn't do instruction sheets in the model or outside the model. So um, I'm actually going to demo some of these things. But um, one of the things I take advantage of is data validation. And I know that I'm sure the majority of our audience being Excel developers, you know what this is. And so when we create data validation, for example, lists, well, actually any kind of data val validation, we have that those, those three tabs, right? So I always use the input message so that the client, the, so the user gets a little pop-up note. And what this effectively does is it creates what I call real-time instructions at the cellular level, right? So give them, because they don't read, We've already established that. Nobody like reads. Right there in your face. In you your click face. on the cell and you cannot miss it. Love exactly it. Exactly at the moment you need it and not before. Because mm -hmm. if you try to embed all the everything they need to know about the model in the instruction sheet, they're gonna they're gonna get bored by paragraph three and then they have to keep going back and going, oh, what am I Which section, section is that? You know, where this right. is in context, which is right. Great. So this is yeah, it's very context specific. Um, now, of course, um, Data validation has some caveats that you know it can be destroyed with copy paste, and so um, I have some some. In, when we get to the demo section, I'll show you some of my favorite workarounds for that, um, because we all know that you know this is lovely. I've got this list in the background of departments they can choose from, but guess what happens when they choose their or they they paste a list of departments from another file? All the data validation goes bye bye. So people forget that. And um, it's, so it's important to have some reset mechanisms. So we'll, we'll see an example of that later on. Ooh. Yeah. Good and we that. talked about cell notes. Um, but the thing about cell notes, same caveat as data validation. If you paste over a note that had a cell in there, the, 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 the note's just going to go away, I think, right? They haven't changed that, have they? So if I copy paste over, a, anyway, I, I believe it's the same. All right. So, um, but you know, it's, if it's um, the other, oh, I should mention the other caveat that uh, it also doesn't have the same features as data validation. So you don't get with cell notes, you don't get to you know have the have the the lists and the the you know input controls. You know, enter only numbers, enter only text. So definitely, <clears throat> data validation is much more feature rich, and I've used it just for the note alone. Even if there's no list, yeah, there's no, yeah. you know, just for the note alone, because I, I just, it's also a little bit of a cleaner look as well. All right. So how are we doing on time? Okay, great. Techniques showcase. So one of the techniques that I like to implement as a solution to the documentation challenge um, is something called wizard style instructions. So when I said I don't create single sheet instructions, I kind of lied, but they're not the kind of instructions you think. So let's, because I know we have a lot of <clears throat> Excel nerds in the room, I'm gonna play a bit of trivia. You sure do. <laughs> we should, I mean, if they're not, and I don't know what, what they're doing on this, on this uh, forum here, but uh -huh. all right, so let's talk about, um, before we get into the actual technique, I just wanna give credit where credit is due. Uh -huh. So I'm going to give you some clues about this person who inspired this next technique that I will shortly demo. Um, and uh, let's just get right into it. So this is called, this is picture round. And the way picture round works is I'm going to give you some clues and there's going to be, I think, seven clues. And at any point, if you know who this person is, whether it's after the first clue or after clue number seven, just type it into the to the chat. And, okay, uh, we're ready, we're ready. You ready? Okay, so keep an eye. Danielle, you already know who the person is, so if anyone knows who it is, I guess you win the prize we haven't come up with yet. Okay, okay. Um, so the technique in, que in question can be best described as wizard style instructions. The person, this person in question is an Excel MVP. 
The wizard style instru instruction techniques were showcased in a book called Ec Advanced Excel Essentials. The person is a comedian, but not Australian. And it's uh, not Bi Bill Jelen. That's it's not Bill Jelen. No. Yes, no. That's, that's another clue. I guess a good quest. Good, 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 good guess. Good guess. <clears throat> yes. He is a comedian, but he's not Australian. Sorry, <laughs> Australians. We have comedians here too, you know. Oh, Oz <laughs> du Soleil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not, it's, uh, not, it's not Oz. It's not, it's not Oz. It's not oh. Oz. Um, this person appeared in a leading role in at least one of the following. The 1988 <laughs> comedy film Young Einstein or the popular YouTube series. Ooh. That ended in disaster. Oh. So TV. Uh -huh. Okay, we're getting closer. Yes. yes. We are getting closer. Get to the, get to the, get to the, get to the, okay, to the punchline. Okay. Clue number six, this person is pictured in at least one of the images here. <laughs> and the final clue is it he was, is not in yes. fact Yahoo serious, although I've never seen him <laughs> in the same room either. So has anyone guessed? Yes, Amathea um, <laughs> was the first person to say Jordan Goldmeyer. Hey, so I think it was the hair that gave it away when you mentioned it. Was, it the was hair. indeed the hair. So my friend Jordan wrote a book called Advanced Excel Essentials, and I promised him I would give him full props. He was I actually was. one of our guests here yes. on the virtual meetups just recently, not long ago. Oh, yeah. that's right. He was on the virtual meetup recently. Mm -hmm. So go, Jordan. Um, he wrote a book called Advanced Excel Essentials, and I really liked the way he did this wizard. I did mine a little bit differently, but um, I'm going to show you how you can create using a worksheet based um, instruct quote unquote instructions guide. But you'll notice it's not really like other instruction guides that you have seen. So let's switch over to, hopefully you can see my Excel window now. Here it is. Okay, so we are, um, this is a worksheet. It's Excel, nothing up my sleeves here. Um, we are at the Meowy Cats Cafe and I've got on the left hand side here, I've got just this um, instruction panel basically. So essentially when I'm- Nice. Yeah, so when I, and there is a little bit of VBA in the background, but, um, and, and like Danielle said, we will make these files available to anyone who would like them after the session today. Uh, there's a little bit of VBA. You know in what? Background. I'm going to send them to everyone whether you'd like them or not. So <laughs> okay. Fabulous. Um, but the VBA is not terribly scary and it's easily adaptable. I do promise you that much. Um, if you've never touched macro in your life, you, you, you could still do it with just a little bit of additional instruction from me. But so we're not gonna <clears throat> demo the code line by line, but I just wanna give you an overview of how it works. So essentially you've got this um, interface here and it's a worksheet. I've just done some fancy formatting. I took away the grid lines. On the left-hand side here, we have hyperlinks. And the magic that is in the background with VBA, two things happen when I click on any one of these, well, a few things happen when I click on a hyperlink. When I click on a hyperlink, it takes me to as you know, hyperlinks take me to a specific cell in the worksheet. So with that, I'm able to do all kinds of stuff in the code to say, hey, when you hit cell, if you're in you know, cell I7, do this, this, and this. Um, and here's what, here's what those things are. One of the things is these, these instructions are gonna change. And those instructions, by the way, I do have a hidden sheet in here. I just want to show you um, that it's really not that complicated. This is a backend sheet where you, you can change the verbiage of the instructions and those instructions will be fed into this little box as I navigate through the different sections. So for example, when I go to import my list of hungry cats, it takes me to this cell here where it's going to prompt me to um, maybe change the file. So I've got these external files I want to import. This little button here has a macro attached to it that will launch my Windows browser. And it also does two other things. It clears the previous file out. And you may have noticed it also cleared this table out. So when I choose nice. Kitty DeVore, it will pop the name of that uh, file into that cell again. And now it will, um, the next thing I can do is wait for it to uh, update my table. Should happen 
should happen on any minute now this this is really cool yeah. and it's it's what i really like is that it's it's an example of something that you just wouldn't expect the client to right. um, to, to to really care about how it works it's just Correct. really automated and so the other <clears throat> The other thing that happened in the background, although there was a there was about a five second delay, is mm -hmm. the other thing I have attached to that macro button is that it, it imports the file and then that's fed into a Power Query, and that Power Query, um, if you guys didn't know, you can refresh Power Queries with VBA. It's literally like a you know it's Active Workbook dot refresh all. It's a mm -hmm. really simple line. Same as with a pivot table or refresh everything. Yeah. Right, and so the other things that are happening with the code. Um, you notice as I select the table, it kind of adjusted my scroll column, so it moved over to the right a little bit. So we're taking advantage of the scroll window property in VBA. Um, and I prom like I, I keep promising because I know some people really hate the idea of VBA, <laughs> but I find that there's still some things that are really useful. Uh, you know that that Power Query just doesn't do. Power Query is not really for this kind of purpose. So um, refresh my table. It also added some. Um, data validation and um, that and now I'm able to update my quantities so all these kitties are going to get a certain you know quantity of food and when I say review it's going to tell me oh you're about to send you know order 18 ounces of cat food and then you can send now so I, I, you know we're not going to get too into the minutia of this but I just wanted you to kind of get a sense for what a great way to avoid having, you know, instruction sheets. So notice I could have designed this model with a one page instruction, you know, explaining in detail every single section, what you need to do. Um, obviously this is a pretty simplified example, but I've used this um, technique and it's always been a real winner with clients for some much, much more complicated uh, models that the scientific uh, client comes to mind. Um, they had to consolidate a lot of CSV files and and do a bunch of calculations in the back end and create a bunch of reports and um, we use some power query but we also used VBA to to really I find it to really shine for things like this creating an interface that's intuitive um, that you know the client will respond to so all right so let's keep going because I and um, I'm a big fan of the whole sort of step one step two step three yeah. thing because it's yeah. really super clear what you have to do absolutely. So I have a couple others, um, and one of these techniques um, I actually used in the uh, demo we just did, but I don't know if you guys were aware, because this is actually the trick that stumped Bob Ulmus, you can use data validation techniques to choose a formula. So you can create named formulas, and instead of having your client accidentally delete a formula, they just pick from a dropdown. So, <clears throat> and I actually have that implemented in the little cat cafe model we just saw, but um, I, I want to, before I show you that, I want to uh, just say a word about Excel password protection because one of the common, um, you know, <laughs> comments I get is, well, can't we, can't we just, pa you know, can't we just put a password on this? And then, you know, the formulas are fine, right? Well, okay, so that's a whole loaded question. And again, in my, um, in my uh, book, uh, I, I get into a whole decision tree about, you know, what are we really talking about when we use, when we want to use Excel passwords? Is it really a good method for preventing screw ups? The, the, without going through this lovely Nazi Schneiderman diagram, the, the conclusion here is really no. It, it's not going to work because Excel passwords are incredibly easy to crack. Um, also, they, they cause a lot of frustration. I prefer to just have the, re have the magic reset button. If you're worried about formulas being destroyed, this is another area where um, VBA is great. Um, you know, absolutely, I, I try to leverage Power Query where, where I can, but sometimes when you just can't get around it and you have to build complex formulas, I like to have a reset button. So, cheat protection is not really going to save your life. So let me that's show cool. you. That's cool. I really like that, that decision tree. I hadn't seen that before, so that's really cool. Um, so here's another example of where I used um, this technique. We're going we're gonna to leave our meowy cats alone for the moment, and we're going to switch over to this other um, file that I had prepared in advance, like on the cooking shows. Oh, I have this file ready to go. 
Um, so here we have some, you know, standard looking data validation. In the background here, we have a customer table with name, address, city, and state, right? So really simple examples here today. Um, each of these blue cells have data validation applied, but when you actually look at the uh, list or the, uh, the, the um, source of the list, um, these are, these are formula driven. So for example, this one happens to be a formula that allows me to choose from a list of customers on that backend table. All right, so that one's, that one's kind of fun, but here's another one. This one is address lookup. How did I get, how do we get, so I can type whatever I like in here, um, 123 Main Street, but if I would prefer to just look up the address on the table, I can choose address lookup. Cool. So what's going on there? And this was the trick that stumped Bob Omlis. Speaking of Bob Omlis. We love really Bob Omlis. He was our last, he, we, we had him on the show like a couple of, couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Bob was my technical editor on my book and he didn't believe me that this technique works, but then I- This is cool, this is cool. One. So yeah, so in the data validation, and again, I've, I've screenshotted it here. Um, so you can kind of follow along better when you get the file, but we have, we all know we have the ability to create named ranges, right? But some of us weren't aware you can create named functions. I think there's a new way to do that Lambda or some crap I haven't explored yet, but um, yes. <laughs> think of Lambda. Anyway, um, so address lookup, notice in the refers to box, I don't have a range, I don't have a value, I have a formula. So when you plug that formula in, what it allows you to do is, is use that in data validation. So the, the trick here, when you create your data validation, you have to use a plus sign. Ooh, you can't use, okay. don't ask me okay. why, this might have been one of those old things that was in Excel for years and years. So it doesn't, it works with an equals though, doesn't it? It doesn't. It doesn't, okay, wow, cool. Yeah. See, it just, yeah, you want to use plus because that'll, that'll allow you to look at it. I, I haven't tried it with equals in years, so but cool. plus address lookup lets the validation know that it's a formula wow. in the back end. So, so it's just I, like a web page, you know, when you're entering one of those online forms. Yes, it is. Like that. Yeah, cool. exactly. So look it up. And, and the key to, again, the key is using that plus sign. And, and if you want to make it a flexible input, allowing your user to put in an alternate address if they like, just make sure that you uncheck this one because okay. then that you're preventing okay. them yeah. from entering a custom value. You know, maybe build, build to address is different or whatever. Um, so, so hopefully this is, you know, inspiring your imaginations a little bit. So that's what I had for demos, we, we did have another one, but I think we are a little bit short on time. I want to I want to check in and see if there's any questions or. Yeah, yeah, we did have a good question was um, uh, Amathia, uh, Amathia is asking um, what your take is on Office scripts. I just wondered whether you had um, had used them yet. Um, I know that we've got, we've had our, actually our next session uh, coming up in a couple of weeks is with Mark Proc Proctor and he'll be talking about uh, Excel online um, and getting into some more on Office scripts. Um, um, but the question, I mean, have you used them and what's your take on them? I haven't used them for clients yet. Mm -hmm. I've been experimenting with them uh, myself and I, I think there's a, definitely a lot of promise there. It, it's still not quite as feature rich as VBA. So for example, I don't know if I'd be able to use it for, you know, like the instruction, the, the wizard that I showed mm. you earlier. I don't know if, it, if we can use Office scripts for that. But the, the big disadvantage, of course, of VBA is that it's not cloud friendly. So, you know, um, so I think over time, we'll, well it's we'll been out for so, it's so long, like it's so old. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the trade up with that is like, yes, it's been around for so long. And so it means it's not really compatible with the cloud. But if you have a question about VBA and you Google it, you're going to find your answer in three minutes. That's and, true. And so That's true. The newer technologies are just not as well known, so there's not as much support out there. Um, it just, you know, I think over time, it's going to be really exciting to see where that goes. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically my take. Yes, I see a lot of promise. Have I implemented it in, in a client environment, not for these types of things? So new. And these things take such yeah. a long time. Like right. even though we start using them and, and get to grips with them, it still takes a while before they become mainstream. And unless something is main, until it's something is mainstream, 
I'm always reluctant to implement right. for clients. Exactly. Because, so, you know, yeah. yeah, no, it's true. And I, so I, I really appreciate the question because it's, mm. you know, it's tr sometimes there, there is an advantage to the tried and true. And it's simply because you, you're almost guaranteed it's going to work. If you do it right, it's going to work. So the newer stuff, eh, sometimes it's still a little buggy. So, you know, that's trade-offs. That's yeah, the theme for tonight. Yeah, cool. So, All right. I think that's it for the questions for now. Um, did you have more for us? Or is that um, the, the almost, last one you'll, almost, you'll get? It's really, um, almost, it's really basic. We have about five minutes to go. Okay. Yeah. We have yeah, about cool. five minutes. Okay. So the last demo I had is just really basic. It's almost not even uh, necessary to open the, the actual spreadsheet. But one of the things I like to do in lieu of, you know, extensive documentation is create a workbook contents sheet. So workbook contents, you can, you know, oh, type this is so handy. handy. Yeah. And just make yeah. it look nice. It, it really goes a long way. So this is my standard. If you ever see anything like this, I probably created it. I always do this, you know, like light dotted line. I'd like to make the rows mm -hmm. nice and spacious. Uh, you can even take off row and column headers if you prefer that. But these are all hyperlinks and those go to the individual sheet tabs. And then it gives you another opportunity to kind of give a more, you know, we talked about the targeted cell by cell type instructions. This allows you to keep it a little more high level. You know, on this worksheet, we do that. This is the purpose of this. And, um, I, you know, especially if you have a workbook that has a lot of worksheets in it, I, I generally create these for all of my my models as well. And then I usually use um, color coding for a reason, like a lot of people color code, to, you know, to, to no end, because, and then nobody knows what the color coding schemes mean. Um, so it's a, it only that information only lives inside the head of the user, you know, let's let's highlight this row yellow and that one pink and then blue and what does it all mean? I don't know, so and so created it three years ago, you know, so use colors but have them mean something. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for example, I like to use uh, sheets that are meant for inputs. You know, let's make those blue, reports, yeah. let's make those green. And then you'd be surprised over time, your clients start to kind of learn. Uh, consistency is is hugely important. So they, they learn your style and then, you know, you, you really start to see some economies of scale with the next product that you deliver or even internally you know if you kind of have or even internally style, yeah yeah, yeah that you sort of have a company style like you know this color means this and and, and people right. get to know it and, yes you know, of course if your client has their own um you know if, if they have their own branding that they like to stick to then absolutely um you know you should you should adjust to that but if you if they don't then use your own you know and then it'll it, is, it kind of kind of becomes your signature your trademark okay so, with that that's it. Ta -da. Ta -da. Ta -da. Wow. Wow. That was amazing, Sylvia. Thank you so much. That was um that was uh really, really useful. So um yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I can't believe you're actually going to uh yeah, I can't believe you're going to uh, to share all of that um, those files with us. So uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm very happy to. Yeah. yeah, and if anybody has any questions, um you know, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. Yeah, there actually were a couple of last minute questions, but I might um, okay. send them to you. Um, oh, yeah. And you can um, get in touch with Sylvia. Probably the best place is on LinkedIn to um, to follow yeah. up the questions because we're pretty much um, out of time now. So, um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, I do see that. Dan Johnson has a question about preventing uh, user errors for formulas. And, and the short answer to that, Dan, is I use I generally use VBA to reset the formulas. Mm. But can, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I can offer you a bit more yeah. detail around that. Yeah. Yeah. There's another one about extracting tab names to create table of contents in a file. Um, I've seen that done with VBA, but just quickly, have you seen any other quick ways? I actually it? have. Um, and I, I use I use that's exactly what I use. There's okay, so this is you know I'm gonna date myself here, but I have an old add-in from John Walkenbach. Oh, okay. Called um, Power Utility Pack, and here's the thing: I think you can only get it from he doesn't he like disappeared off the internet, so I still yeah. have this add-in. But it is there are BBA macros that you can probably find. Yeah. We'll do something. So that will do it. Yeah. That'll do it. He has a create a workbook content. Yeah, it's sheet. quite useful. It's, yeah. Yeah. We often, oh, so that's yeah, hyperlinks even. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. That's so easy. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Other questions, feedback? No, I think that's good. All, All right. right. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks so much, Sylvia. And we'll send everything out to everybody. And um, yeah, hope to uh, catch up with you. I uh, hope it's not going to be another couple of years before we hear from you, Sylvia. I know, especially live and in, in person. Yeah, yeah.
yeah. in lockdown. And so, um, so anyway, uh, appreciate uh, the time and and appreciate all of the participants. Yes, yes, very, uh, very interactive session. So thanks everybody, and uh, we'll see you again soon. All right, Bye take care.